The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to this webinar on diversity and inclusion. Um, what we are looking forward to in this webinar is not to preach to the choir because everybody understands the basics, the fundamentals of diversity and inclusion. But the attempt and the objective will be to a uh, little bit tread into the unexplored territory of actually making it work, um, actually being able to connect with the business objectives of diversity and inclusion, um, and therefore making the business case really strongly uh, and therefore enabling more and more organizations to be able to uh, do justice to their diversity and inclusion initiatives. Really looking forward to sharing uh, some thoughts and some frameworks with you. A quick introduction to Inspire One. Uh, some of you may already know us. For the others, we are uh, largely into the space of leadership and organization development solutions. The approach is that of connecting whatever development solutions we work on to a business impact that can be created. The approach is also to ensure that whatever learning is being provided to leaders or organizations is done in an applicable way so that learning is not seen as a parallel track to the day job. It needs to be wedded. It needs to be dovetailed. Uh, we are fortunate to have worked for the last 20 years with more than 300 companies in India. We are globally connected with uh, three partners who provide us the research, the validated content, etc., around leadership assessment and development, around service cultures, and around enhancing sales effectiveness. Uh, so that's uh, a little bit about us. I'd like to now welcome Harshita Chaudhary from Nestle. Um, we'll, she's our guest speaker today, and she will add immense value to whatever we are talking about by sharing the Nestle context of, you know, why are they into the diversity and inclusion space? Uh, what are the challenges they have faced? What are the what are the initiatives that they have? implemented and towards what success and what do they look forward to doing in future. So brief introduction about Harshita. She is uh, the talent head for Nestle South Asia region. Uh, she's, she's a TESS alumina and has previously worked with Mondelez, Colgate, Palmolive and Honeywell. Uh, at Nestle, she leads the portfolio of acquisition, learning, people processes and DNI. Uh, but from my interactions with her, I can clearly see that the passion for DNI is over and above everything else that she does, and it comes through so clearly in the way she, you know, talks about it and shares her views. Uh, in fact, her efforts and her approach in DNI has uh, helped Nestle become uh, an employer of choice and also one of the hundred best companies for women. I'm looking forward to her inputs to the webinar also. Uh, I am Suman Sethi. I work with Inspire One, have been with IO for uh, for the last 20 years, for donkey years, I call them. And I work largely in the space of leadership assessment development and also organization uh, development from the point of view of culture uh, change. So helping or working with organizations to enable them to create the kind of culture that they would like to and they believe would support their business strategy. So that's a little bit about the company, about uh, Harshita and me. I'll now move into uh, the agenda of whatever we need to cover in this one hour. Uh, Harshita and I can speak for hours on this, but uh, since it's a one hour webinar, we will try and curb our passion and enthusiasm and stick to the priority messages. Uh, just one, uh, one uh, input to all of you. We would love to get questions from you because that's what really makes the whole process uh, interactive and value adding. What we will do with the questions is that at the end of the webinar, we'll try and answer whatever we can. Uh, but if the time is up, then we will certainly send uh, an offline response through the email and you have a questions 
tab on your screens, uh, which is where you can write your questions and send them across to us. So moving on to the agenda, we will talk about why diversity and inclusion, the real business case. I don't expect to spend too much time on it because I think one part of the business case is understood, but we need to look at the part that most companies when they are researched are not yet cognizant of or have not yet really uh, embedded it into their uh, strategy. So we'll talk a little bit about it. We will then move on to talking about, you know, really dismiss, uh, demystifying the inclusive culture because there is a lot of talk, there is a lot of narrative about, you know, companies should be inclusive and so on and so forth, but there doesn't seem to be too much empirical experience available in the market about how do we create an inclusive culture? And firstly, what does it mean? You know, why do we want to do it? What does it mean? We will move into fostering inclusion. So really talk about certain best practices over here and also a framework that can help create that culture shift. And that framework is really useful because it's applicable. It makes things very doable and it removes, you know, it moves us from the 30,000 feet, uh, 30, feet view to actually the brass tacks and what needs to be done. Harshita will be sharing her experience with the DNI initiative with Nestle um, as we move along at every step. So uh, going first and foremost to why diversity and inclusion, we'd like to start from you know, the global idea of diversity and inclusion because that's really where it begins from. Um, and unfortunately, as we see our world today or as we see our country today, we are as a globe, as a, you know, as the entire globe and as a country, we are hugely diverse, but unfortunately not completely inclusive. So diversity is defined by, by a huge number of factors, the ethnicity, the color, the religions, the three worlds, you know, the third world countries, the gender, the age, the backgrounds that we come from, the languages we speak, the customs we have, and so on and so forth. So the, so the spectrum of diversity is very large, uh, though right now the focus is more on you know, gender and age-related diversity. But ultimately, if you're looking at an inclusive culture, we will need to look at an inclusive culture for everybody in the organization and not just you know, the highlight points which are, which are forming most of the narrative right now. Uh, historically, when we have looked at diversity and inclusion, good times have been identified as, as times where varied and diverse populations have coexisted in harmony. So historically, when we look back to the good times of the country, of the world, those are good times where, you know, people of diverse backgrounds have been able to coexist. Uh, well, and the bad times are very, very, very clearly defined as intolerance and non-inclusion. Um, inclusion or the lack of it is a growing concern globally. Uh, we see it more and more every day with what's happening in the U.S. We see it in what's happening in Europe through Brexit, through the EU elections that have happened, where the nationalist voices are becoming stronger. Um, and you know the whole migrant crisis etc so instead of becoming you know using these as opportunities to become more inclusive more and more countries around the globe are looking at making countries watertight pulling up the walls again and uh, the nationalist approach that is a growing concern the question that everybody needs to answer of course at the national level but what we are looking at the corporate level is how tolerant and how tolerant are we going to be of in intolerance? How tolerant are we going to be of the non-inclusive approach that exists in the uh, world? The way we look at it, and the way we see, you know, more and more DNI narrative becoming part of a lot of organizations that we work with, we really believe that organizations, corporates all over the world can actually be the catalysts or the triggers to create uh, inclusion. Because if it starts from corporations, it'll impact people who are working in the corporations, and then it becomes wider, 
you know, more widespread. And we believe that that momentum can actually change the course of how nations are also looking at inclusion. So no mean task. I think it's an onerous uh, responsibility on all of us to make sure that, you know, diversity and inclusion is looked at in the spirit of it. Uh, like I said a little while back, diversity is larger than just gender, race and age. We look at diversity at human levels, which which also transcends, you know, the physical, the way we look, the mental abilities that we have, the whole IQ, you know, the whole IQ debate that goes on, the sexual orientation these days is becoming a very, uh, very relevant and very meaningful debate. Then we move on to culturally how we look at diversity. And culturally, I think India is brilliant in looking at diversity uh, or, you know, not being very inclusive uh, via the way we look at people coming from different states, their accents, the way they speak, the way they eat, the way they, you know, they interact and so on. All of that, though done in, you know, at a very, you know, lighter spirit and through humor, etc., somewhere the root of it lies very embedded in our minds and hearts. So we may make humor out of it, but there are also other implications that come into play. And then finally, we are also looking at organizational diversity. And we've seen very often in organizations, some departments are considered to be more glamorous or more, you know, or higher priority than some other functions. Typically, the front line, so to say, in all organizations is given a lot more investment, a lot more airtime, a lot more focus than the so-called back-end functions. Or in organizations, certain regions that are performing well are given the special status and the special investment and the focus, but the ones that may not be in some way become non-included in the entire uh, you know, scheme of things. Again, when we move into the organization, there are a lot of, uh, there is a, a, a lot of diversity that comes from how we communicate. So our preferred style of communicating or another person's preferred style of communicating, how different leaders look at the task and people orientation. Some of them are more task oriented. Some of them are more people oriented. That also is, is, an, is a type of diversity. How we solve problems is a type of diversity. Um, how we deliver, how we engage people or we don't engage people, all of this comprises the spectrum of diversity. And so therefore, we believe that when we are talking about an inclusive culture, we are not just talking about one or two demographics. We are actually talking about a lot of demographics. And in instead of focusing on each demographic and its, and its typicalities, what needs to really be done is to create an inclusive culture, which is large enough and, and open enough to handle diversity at every level, to to create a safe environment for everybody to thrive and to contribute. Um, so therefore, what we are also looking at is a very big shift. I think the first step of diversity that most companies have looked at is to ensure that we have diverse uh, populations in our, in, our, uh, in our organizations, that our workforce is diverse and represents different demographics that exist in our country. Um, however, that's only the first step. That's a necessary uh, step, but it's not sufficient. Uh, what needs to be done is to close the loop by building an inclusive workspace, a workspace where all these demographics that have been, uh, you know, that have been acquired are able to work together. So the focus or the goal is inclusion and diversity is a lead measure for that or a lead action for that. Again, when we look at diversity, there's two types of diversity. One is the demographic one, as I mentioned earlier, and the other one is the cognitive one. Um, and the demographic uh, diversity actually leads to the cognitive diversity, and which is what is of essence in organizations. So how do people think differently? How do people innovate differently? How do people solve problems differently? How are organizations even looking at catering to a diverse customer base? Because it's not just about providing an environment where, you know, everybody can thrive. It is also about aligning the business strategy to the fact that our customer base is very, very diverse. Uh, inclusion, on the other hand, is, is defined as an environment where there is fairness and respect for all, where everybody feels valued and believes that they are, you know, they have a sense of belonging, which if 
you know all of you remember the maslow's uh, you know hierarchy sense of belonging is a very critical and fundamental uh, need that human beings have and if we don't feel that we belong uh, there is a lot of detriment to what we can share and how we can contribute and also an environment where everybody feels safe and is transparent enough to share their views without any fear of repercussions so for leaders diversity or inclusion actually implies that have they been able to create an environment where everybody and anybody feels comfortable and safe enough to share their views are the leaders able to create an environment where everybody feels valued and respected so look at inclusiveness from all angles and all points of views so a diverse environment uh, an inclusive environment therefore is curated to welcome respect nurture and leverage diversity it is not an environment where diverse people are allowed to come in but not not allowed or not enabled to fit in so there is no point in hiring a lot of diverse demographics unless we have a structure or we have a culture that allows them also to fit in and it is not about demographic parity it is not about you know having a certain number or a certain percentage of a certain demographic coming in it is far more than that it is about the outcome of getting diverse thinking into your work into your workspace so you know that whole quota system or that whole percentage system of we must get such and such percentage of millennials and we must get such and such percentage of women and so on and so forth while it's important as a first step it has unfortunately become an end in itself so if people are able to hire people and meet those criteria they feel that you know they've done their bit on diversity and inclusion and we are really looking at moving forward on that so what is the rationale what is the whole uh, you know fundamental for why we should be diverse and why we should be inclusive so some of the very sensible and very apparent reasons are that we leverage diverse people to problem solve in different ways to deliver in different ways to analyze in different ways and that's what brings the richness how people deal with the evidence with options outcomes how people deal with processes etc is you know different strengths in different people and how do we ensure that we get everybody's strength on the table then there is that whole space of the fact that you know it's a non negotiable uh, priority now for most organizations because our customers are diverse and i think one of the things that we uh, you know as an industry one section of industry did very well was to recognize that children are becoming a you know a stronger force in decision making and i think the the way that you know things were advertised etc to to target children to be able to drive decisions uh, that customer base was captured very well to the annoyance of i think the entire parent demographic because suddenly they realized that their children were you know pushing them to make certain kind of purchases but the fact is that you know the fundamental fact is that a diverse customer was recognized and was given the due respect and so on uh the reputation factor is very important for uh, organizations so till now we have been looking at how does being environmentally friendly add to our reputation how does uh being very conscious of you know which organizations are we dealing with how are they handling their workforce and so on and so forth was very critical for organizations and now diversity is taking on that mantle and being a very very big factor in how the brand appears in the market um to our mind in inspire one we feel that you know fundamentally just being humane uh, should be the rationale for why we should be inclusive it's just such a need at a basic human level uh, to do that and to transcend all kinds of differences there is also the business impact which is also a sensible reason and research of various types and there are many researches available now what we have tried to do is that we've tried to cull those out and see you know what comes out as a as a pattern uh, i think organizations that are uh, diverse and inclusive exceed exceed their financial targets by two times more they are more innovative and agile and therefore they are getting better business uh, outcomes from uh, whatever they are doing in that space 
again, like I said, I'm not going to preach to the choir and talk about, you know, whatever financial benefits are available for being uh, diverse and inclusive. Um, so these are just figures that are supporting what we spoke about in the earlier slide. Um, what I would like to do now is also request Harshita, Harshita to come in and share with us what has diversity meant for Nestle and what has inclusion meant for Nestle and how have they started approaching it. Uh, Harshita, over to you. Thank you and uh, hello everyone. Uh, very, very glad to be part of this webinar. What I'm going to attempt to do is just talk to you about some really um, in reality, what is it that we are seeing in, in my organization? What are some of the experiences that we are having in the space of inclusion and diversity? Uh, also, so just some brass facts. So, Harshita, we are losing your voice intermittently. Uh, could you uh, could you just come closer to uh, the mic or the speaker? Uh, we are losing the voice intermittently. Hi, everyone. Just a moment. I think there's a little glitch in the sound. Just trying to uh, put that right. Just give us a moment. Uh, I think there is a little bit of a technical issue. So what I will do is that I'll just take another minute to see if it can settle down. Thank you for your patience. Can you hear me? Loud and clear. Much better. Loud. Yeah. OK, cool. Thank you. Thank you. Sorry for that. Mm -hmm. I think my microphone decided to not work for a bit. No uh, So uh, what I was saying was that thank you so much for having me here. But for us, uh, any kind of di diversity that you talk about gets manifested in the organization. Uh, whether you talk about, so we are a hundred and, and we, we are very proud when we say we are 105 year old young organization because we've been in India for 105 years. But if you look at our generational diversity, we are about 70% millennials. Uh, if you talk about geographical diversity, we are represented across states. Um, we have uh, people based out of every part of the country and global for the global organization I can talk about we are based out almost of all geographies geographies in the global organization also in India from a mix of mixed point of view we have a number of expats who come to India and work with us from a nationalities point of view as I said about 15 nationalities are represented in India and that's where I'm talking about expats that come and work with us from a thought diversity uh, to, be, uh, to, to start with, respect for diversity is our core value. And that's the value that Nestle works with. And then respect for diversity is your value and you really live and breathe it. Uh, then, um, then it sort of also manifests itself in everything that I've just spoken about, whether it's generational, nationality, etc. And as I just mentioned, respect for diversity is our core value. Uh, we start with respect for ourselves, which also means that you respect who you are, your thoughts, your team, their thoughts, etc. Respect for diversity of every kind. And as uh, Suman had also mentioned sometimes, and to be very honest, that's a reality in FMCG still, that gender diversity plays up more because we, there is a long way, at least in the industry that I work, that we have to um, go even in gender diversity. 
But if you look at any other diversity, whether thought, whether nationality, etc., these are also pieces that exist with us. While gender diversity is still the focal point, because there's a huge amount of work to be done over there. Respect for others, as I mentioned, respect for others' thoughts, respects for where they come from, their cultural background, their context. Respect for that is extremely important, and respect for the future. So, respect for diversity, sitting in the middle, being core of who we are. Can we move to the next slide, please? Okay. Now, as Suman has shown you data around why uh, organizations should be inclusive, to us, honestly, we never had to create a business case for it because it is a reality for us. We have uh, we produce products like Maggie, um, Kit Kat, etc., and hope you all are users of of, of some or more of them. Um, but the reality with us is these are products which either a mother uh, buys for her kids or consumes herself. We have a huge nutrition range also where we have products for mothers, but in some way or the other, a mother is playing a key role on uh, on even you know earning the salary that I would uh, sit and earn in the organization. So for us, it's actually a reality because 70% of our shoppers are women. We move to the next slide, please. Okay, so the other bit is that what we have and we truly believe in, and that's the, that's the last thought that's written on this slide is that diversity of thoughts that in specific diversity of thoughts and that's why i said that while gender is a huge uh, huge space that we are working on and creating but the the real inclusion which is the inclusion of being uh, of allowing people to be who they are allowing the thoughts that they have allowing just to be my own self um, really leads to and we truly believe in the organization really leads to quantum leaps when the organization has to make so let me give you a very uh, live example from this year and each one of you would have heard that in 2015 we went through the very very famous Maggie crisis what got us out of the crisis was the fact that each one of us in our own way went into wanting to wanting to make it right wanting to do what we could and at that point in time the organization said this is the time that i sort of bring everybody together use each other's thoughts figure out a way of how we are going to manage the whole thing when we came out of the crisis we were an organization which which had so many people coming us to us with innovative ideas we had realized that agility was a very important thing, speed was important, and actually customer satisfaction in the end. So the crisis itself taught us that because we were an extremely diverse organization, an inclusive organization, an organization said, okay, do your bit of making sure that we get out of this crisis. And that's where we saw that every each one of us came together and we got out of it. You look at any, uh, you look at any startup today that has come in and, and honestly, even big organization like us, startups are our competitors. You look at any organization, the thought difference, looking at something in a different way has, is actually the genesis of most of them. They have looked, for example, there's an organization uh, which has looked at as to how do I solve the frustration of, uh, of a customer when the TV breaks down? Why does it just take so much time? Uh, for me to get a reaction from the customer service and they've just got onto that space and sort of made a whole company out of it and it is one of the um, you one of the unicorn companies so it's just the diversity of thought and a realization of how powerful can different thoughts be that quantum leaps in an organization or even the genesis of organization sits on so we truly believe that diversity is not only a reality from a business point of view for us but also if you talk about innovation, if you talk about speed and agility, or if you talk about customer satisfaction, all of this will be achieved only if there is a diversity of thought. There is an ecosystem which allows that thought to be tabled. And that's what I wanted to really say in this place. Thanks a lot, Harshita. I think that adds uh, the empirical context really well. Um, I think two points from what Harshita has spoken that, that struck me as very critical points is that sometimes crisis becomes the way to actually do the right thing or crisis becomes the forcing device for us to move in the right direction. And I think that's very, very clear in what Harshita shared. Uh, and in addition to, you know, the innovation and the agility, one of the things that a lot of leaders have spoken about when they talk about what diversity and inclusion has helped us with is 
the ability to uh, to identify and mitigate risks in time because you know different people are able to look at whatever you are bringing to the market in different ways and so therefore are able to recognize the risks preemptively and then mitigate them uh, we'll quickly move on to the whole piece on diverse you know demystifying what an inclusive culture is because having understood the the fundamental reason behind it we need to now also see how we can uh, uh, we can move ahead on it. So uh, for doing that, uh, it's critical to identify or establish what is the current state of inclusion. Uh, so the current state of inclusion is that most companies are still promoting diversity as a mandate and yet not really homed on to the tangible or intangible business benefits of it, uh, which is fine, which is a good first step, but that shouldn't be the, the end itself. Uh, some of the leading companies like Nestle have started the process and have actually traversed quite a distance on the path of moving from compliance, a compliance obligation to becoming part or the, or the driving force behind the business strategy. And uh, currently only about 20% companies that were researched uh, in a research that was done by Human Capital uh, believe that they are in a complete state of readiness to create an inclusive culture or they have traversed a long distance on that. Uh, what is therefore the desired state? Very clearly the desired state is that we have to move away from just the compliance uh, imperative, uh, just the imperative of recruiting diverse people, just the imperative of being politically correct. We have to make a movement from there and move into the areas that we already spoke about the diversity of thinking, inclusive leadership, differentiation versus competition, becoming a preferred employer, and also being cognizant of the customer, very respectful of the customer. And I think some companies, at least in their external communication, have started doing that. So that very popular Lloyd washing machine ad, you know, where they talk about the washing machine actually being a unisex washing machine, a really nice way to project the fact that you know, that's that's the responsibility of both uh, partners in a relationship. Those detergent ads that are coming, which definitely look at the boy girl uh, inclusion, they look at the religious inclusion and so on and so forth. I think one of the ads that really struck me was by a large insurance company where the mother is uh, an Indian mother is telling her son when he's about to get married that he needs to invest for a house where his wife and he can live together. And I think coming that message being projected from an Indian mother made a lot of impact. Uh, I think the desired state also is the fact that people who are diverse should not be expected to fit in, uh, but they should actually be welcomed into that culture. Uh, there is a lot of pressure of something called the covering behaviors, which is an interesting concept to understand where, uh, you know, people who are diverse or in minority go out of their way to feel assimilated in the culture by downplaying their differences. So they try and, you know, dress up like the, the, the majority. They try and speak in the accent of the majority. They try and adopt the customs of that majority they don't want to associate with their own, uh, you know, their own group of people. They want to downplay the differences, etc. Now, these are called covering behaviors and no person in an organization should have to feel the need for, you know, using these covering behaviors. He should feel that he or she should feel that they're absolutely OK in the way that they are and they add value like that. So therefore, what are the big challenges that the Indian, uh, not just Indian, but, you know, a lot of workplaces need to look at? They need to look at the existing and deeply embedded unconscious biases. So even though a lot of us externally and consciously feel that we are not biased, if we really reflect, there are a lot of biases that all of us live with. Uh, moving on, I think one of the biggest challenges that leaders in most organizations are not taking on the mantle for building the inclusive culture. They do not believe that it's their job to do it. And a lot of organizations have created a separate team or a separate position which should focus on DNI. Uh, what we believe, and I think what Harshital also support, is that inclusion has to be a line imperative. One of the biggest challenges that you know our clients face is when the person who's heading diversity and inclusion feels or says that my biggest barrier is my contemporaries, my my colleagues 
who believe that this is my initiative and so therefore do it as a favor for me. Uh, and that's not how it will work. It's not a favor that you're doing to another uh, function. It is what you need to do. Um, gender diversity right now is the most alive and the most, uh, you know, uh, visible diversity that organizations are looking at. But if we look at it, building an inclusive culture, then whether it's gender, whether it is age, whether it is ethnicity, that shouldn't matter. It should just be an inclusive culture, irrespective of the type of uh, diversity. Very clear and consistent messages need to be need to be delivered by the leadership, not just internally, but also externally. It needs to become part of their narrative all the time. And in everything that they, uh, in everything that they do, uh, one of the things that Harshita and I were discussing, which is also a very uh, critical point in the whole inclusion culture, is that it's not in just incumbent on the majority population in an organization to make the efforts to be inclusive. I think the whole piece of one stakeholder that we miss out in all of this is what is the ownership that the you know, the diverse demographic uh, would like to take to also, you know, assimilate not through covering behaviors, but through more progressive behaviors, through more, you know, through doing things in a way that it helps building the inclusive culture and stop seeing themselves as victims of a situation. They have to feel empowered and powerful enough to also be contributing to the inclusive culture. Uh, one of the things that is a big challenge and we often tell our clients or customers to look at it very seriously is that the moment you create, uh, you know, percentages and you say that, you know, so much percentage should be women or so much percentage of women should be promoted or so much, you know, or there should be different policies for women, there should be flexible hours for women and so on and so forth. The more we create the quota system, the more resistance we build in the other population where then women have to face even more backlash to say that you've had it easy or you haven't had to work hard enough and so on and so forth. So the moment we create that distinction or that differentiation, we are actually creating a more diverse, uh, a more uninclusive, non-inclusive environment. So the, so the focus should be on creating policies which are equitable for everybody. So if you're looking at flexible timing, it should be available for everybody in the organization. If you're looking for you know, maternity or paternity benefits, they should be equal for whether it's men or women. That is the only way the worth of the diverse population will be recognized and not resisted by others. Um, there are a lot of biases. I'm not going to spend too much time on it. I think the only thing that we need to understand is that there are almost about 150 types of biases that we have. Uh, and these biases get formed by either our own experiences or the mental preconditioning that happens. And I think the caste system is a very, very clear indicator of the mental preconditioning that still happens in a lot of educated uh, sections also. Um, it is important to understand them. It's important to be aware of them and then work through them. These are just some of the ways in which, you know, some people are defying the stereotypes. So, you know, um, I'm a Delhi boy and I'm fighting for women's rights. So he's defined the stereotype to say that all all men in Delhi are, you know, not very safe for women. I'm a woman and I I can park parallelly like a boss. And that's, an, again, defying a stereotype. In fact, what surprises me so much is that when I see the car or the auto ads coming, even now, most of these ads show men driving the cars. Uh, and it's just such a low hanging fruit for them that they are not really, you know, being they're not leveraging. And I wonder why uh, that is happening. Um, I'd like Harshita to come in over here and, you know, look at these challenges from the point of view of Nestle. What is it that they uh, faced and how did they, uh, you know, dovetail or marry it with their culture? Harshita, over to you. Hi, can you hear me? Yeah. Great. So uh, the slide again sort of is reinforcing, reinforcing the way that we have diversity through our fabric. Uh, if you can move to the next yes. slide, Suman, yes. I'll just uh, sort of take that on. So um, I completely agree and, and to Suman to the pieces that you've spoken about, and these are real pieces. Uh, we see them um, playing out um, 
in different ways um, across different organization and our organization is pretty much part of an ecosystem that exists a social fabric that is, exists in our country and people walking with that social fabric even within our organization but at the base of our organization as we have as i've spoken to you earlier respect of diversity is our biggest value and um, i totally believe and and suman thanks for mentioning this point because i really really rally for this point is to say that the diverse group or the group which needs inclusion etc while i i believe there is no group like that we are all similar and we are all same but those the groups who really get earmarked to be included and need inclusion are uh, are actually we should also look at our own selves if i am diversity and i am a gender diversity i also should look at myself that i should be treated as talent first in an organization and as a gender diversity later and that is that is something that we need to ensure when we walk into any organization we at any level should never be um uh, never be expecting to be treated differently because why should we right we we want to be treated on merit so i'll i'll stop this point here because there are pieces in the next section that i have kept to this the only piece on the slide you see here is that increasingly and this is around the whole messaging communicating the image of the organization etc that i wanted to bring out these three pieces if you see these are three individuals of my company one being a very senior lady this lady in green the very senior man and a very very recent mt who has joined us we actually celebrated the cultural diversity so we stay on the same slide cultural yes. diversity global cultural uh, integration day in our organization we went out we spoke, we created a whole road show within the organization we went out on our social pages and also spoke about it because please remember whether you are in In, in in any organization or a part of any organization do you, you do want um to be communicated about what is the commitment of your organization to diversity also from an imagery of an organization uh i can tell you it is imperative it is a baseline today that an organization needs to be inclusive it needs to uh have an image and believe in that image that yes i celebrate diversity i celebrate inclusion right so that is why we also within our organization talk a lot internally talk externally of what diversity means to us what have we done around it and how important it is so i'll i'll, I'll leave these thoughts as of now so because in the next section i'll bring out everything in terms of initiatives that right right we look at best practices there thanks arshita i will now move on to the third agenda item is that uh, you know having understood why inclusion is critical having understood what does an inclusive culture mean now we'll talk about how can an inclusive culture actually be created uh, what we are looking at an inclusive culture is uh, the first step should be through asking the right questions this is like a self assessment that an organization can do by asking these questions which is what makes people feel included so what are those behaviors what are those policies what are those processes that we need to instill to make people feel included uh, do all employees feel that they are known and valued as individuals like uh, harshita said as talent not as men or women old or young different races but are they valued as talent irrespective of you know what demographic group are is everybody equally connected with everyone else in the company or is there a section of people because they are you know high performers or they are more visible are they more connected with the leadership than the rest of the company so does everybody feel that they are equally connected are they included in decision making so are decisions being taken top down or are decisions being made uh, you know through inputs from everybody how are we ensuring that our processes and the and you know what we review is bringing it across different perspectives so our processes have been thought through from the point of view of all demographics and not just you know what a process should be how do we get business benefit from having all those diverse perspectives how do we get the most out of our talent these are the questions that will create very specific contextual answers for your company you don't then have to depend on you know what are the motherhood statements or what are the platitudes uh, that come and i wonder why they are motherhood statements and not fatherhood statements also but uh, but what we are what we are saying over here is that it, these would be the answers that will give your 
organization the context for why you need to build a, a, a diverse or an inclusive culture. So we are just giving some steps or the critical steps for bridging the gap between the current and the desired state. Uh, first and foremost is establishing a very clear what's in it for me at the leadership level. It has to be driven and it has to be aligned to the business strategy. It has to impact that. Uh, unless we are doing it, we are just paying lip service to it. Very clearly, leaders have to take the mantle of being inclusive. And the first way they can be inclusive is to actually, uh, you know, share uh, something, or we call that self-disclosure, is to actually come out very transparently and talk about the biases they have. I think to be able to project that, yes, I also have biases, and this is what, this is what I have done to be aware of them, and this is what I'm going to do to mitigate them. That kind of makes the environment really open for people to do that. Uh, leaders communicating the WIFM at all levels consistently, not as a mandate, but as a way of life, as a value. I think what Harshita was talking about, it being a core value, uh, that can bring in more uh, you know, sense of urgency than any other mandate would. Uh, building awareness of what are the differences or what are the biases that we are looking at, how do we root them out, for everyone. So very often organizations come and, you know, they'll, they'll say that come and train our women to be how, you know, how to be more, uh, how to be more visible, how to be not, not passive, to be more assertive, to have a personal brand and so on and so forth. Whereas that's a critical part of the puzzle or a critical input. But unless you're training the ecosystem to be inclusive, uh, that's only doing one thing. So yes, some women may need, you know, some input on how to be very visible, but they are not the problem. They are equally talent that is that is available to the organization. So what is required is also to work with the ecosystem to make them more inclusive, uh, which is what is the next point, and develop everyone on how to respect diversity, and finally have equitable policies that do not promote a quota system. Uh, we use a framework at Inspire One, which we call the five box model for change or culture change. And I'll go through this really quickly because what we'd like to do is for Harshita to be able to share best practices of Nestle. Uh, so here we say that, you know, whatever is your strategy, which is a clear value towards creating an inclusion culture, the measures, what are you going to achieve out of being that, that has to be clearly spelled out. That has to be clearly communicated and led by the leaders. So the leadership behaviors and conversations have to be around that. What they start measuring or reviewing also has to align with building an inclusive culture. It's not just about, you know, still continuing to, uh, you know, review only sales numbers or only revenues. It's also important to uh, look at, you know, how much innovation has happened, how much risk mit mitigation has happened and so on and so forth. Uh, we need to build an inclusive em employer brand, and that just doesn't include recruitment, but it includes what happens to people after they've come into the organization. And like I said, aligning policies to be uh, equitable. Workshops to build inclusion and diversity, like I said, for everybody in the organization, which is the skills part. Um, in the structure, we are looking at having a place on the table for all demographic groups with a very specific objective being met uh, by them. And in systems, we are saying that all systems, not just the HR systems or not just the HR processes, but all processes in all functions need to look at how they can become more inclusive of their own people and inclusive of the customer. Uh, there is a lot of work that we have started doing with organizations around it, but I think it will be great to listen uh, and hear Harshita's view on how they've done it at Nestle so that the best practices also come across. Harshita, over to you. Uh, thank you so much. Yes, thank you so much. So uh, the pictures you see here are of uh, what we call in the organization my management committee, which is actually CEO minus one, except the lady in the sari. And I'll explain this to you. Um, so um, what we started with, and as I've been mentioning that, having diversity in my organization is a reality for my business to sustain and develop, right? And I would totally go by someone's point and say that we have to live it, breathe it, believe in it. And like any other organization, um, what do I, what do I uh, 
take up and what do I believe in is when I see my leaders living it, when I see those behaviors, those those messaging coming really from my leaders. So what we did was to start and I will share more initiatives in the next section. But our biggest thing was to show people that and, and to make them make them know and believe that this is really something that organization believes in. My top leadership talks about it with utmost passion, believes in it with utmost passion. So here are the individuals that you that you see, and also to the uh, yeah. Sorry, the sorry. voice was getting a little uh, disrupted, but it's fine now. Sorry, go on. Sure, no problem. So, um, so here you see my heads of businesses, and I'll explain that to you. Also, my CEO, Mr. Narayanan, over here, uh, because the idea is that what you see your leaders messaging out, what you see your leaders believing in, is does also strengthen the tenets in the culture that you are trying to create. Um, also, to Suman's point, what she was mentioning earlier, let's remember one thing. Uh, um, Suman, we stay on this slide. Yes. Let's remember one thing that the, the reality is, for example, in my organization, uh, on an average, I have about 21% women in the company. Is it great? No. Is it great comparable to a technology organization? No. But is it great comparable to, to an FNCG organization? Absolutely, yes. But let's also look at the rest of the 79% of people in this organization. They are men, right? And it is very important, as I saw one slide that Suman had seen, that to, to create champions. But why should we forget that over the years, the successful positions, and as women get to definitely senior positions, the successful positions have been taken uh, taken by men and they are there on those high successful positions. There is some mantra of success that they have they have they have used and they have moved there. Why shouldn't we also learn that? Also it is very important that while women can keep talking about networks, etc. etc. If you do not have 79% of your population really believing in the whole idea of diversity, it will not work. So the individuals you see here are my head of sales, has the largest number of women in an FMCG organization, the opportunity for me to have the largest number of women as being a sponsor on what we call as my diversity and inclusion council. You see my head of technical, who's actually the head of uh, factories, again, an opportunity area, a leader who believes in it and thus a lot of my initiatives in the manufacturing space get done. My head of corporate affairs and my head of communication, because when it comes to internal messaging, it comes to external PR and brand building, we accentuate and talk about diversity because that is important. And my head of HR, we set the maximum numbers within the company, but if you don't have the right policies, the right ecosystem, that an HR head should drive, it will not work. So we have all the individual, all the actors, who can make us an extremely diverse organization sitting on a DNI council with an external person also on our council to keep giving us and showing us the mirror of what we are doing well and what we are not doing well. We can move to the next slide. Okay, so uh, clearly, as I said, the sponsorship of these individuals builds into the ownership of owning the diversity agenda. You see one picture here in ownership, which is of my shops. As I said, my sales field force is an opportunity area for diversity, also an area where I have the highest number of women and you see a factory. And these are two areas where I need women, opportunity for women to become also a part of Nestle. And thus these individuals being sponsors of and being in DNI council, being sponsor of the DNI agenda really helps in bringing in more women in the organization. Moving to the next slide. The next slide. Yeah. Yes, uh, Suman did mention about creating the right ecosystem and I want to just bring in the whole space of unconscious bias over here. Let's remember one thing. Being biased is something that we all have, that we all come in with. Okay, we, we have to stop making feel, people feel that if I have a bias, there is something wrong with me there's nothing wrong with you you'll be just being human what we are trying to 
okay know that if you are taking a very important decision related to people are you being biased in any way and that is what we should drill down into people we can keep talking about the concepts of unconscious bias etc uh, but it is very important to make sure that we tell them that in people decisions like recruitment performance appraisals uh, transfers uh, conversations you are ensuring that you are not biased in any way that is why we have done and a number of workshops in different way including theater including experiences etc where um, we've made really the concept of unconscious bias very relatable contextual and and also something which gives you tools to say okay these are the kind of biases which can come in during the recruitment process these are the questions i should ask myself am i asking those five questions okay if asking five questions all okay we go ahead so that's the kind of modules that we've really created our biggest win in this has been that we have a number of people who work on our shop floor all my shop floor uh, people who work on on shop floor and really produce our products are actually of of union are unionized at the factory level we've actually had union leaders take these modules for for that because people even at that level are able to understand that if they are not biased it is really really going to be helpful in the workplace we move to the next slide yes so just saying these are some tenets of our modules i have a bias what is the bias what are different kinds of bias i have a bias against women and how do you make them aware of that through case studies i have a age bias why do i have a bias how do i overcome a bias so these are all the tenets which really sit into any of our intervention around unconscious bias moving to the next slide okay this is one piece i wanted to leave this session with because we thought we spoke a lot about uh, uh, the whole inclusion space and as suman mentioned the actors in the inclusion space please remember and this is this is this has been a personal experience and this is an advice to anybody who are i who is either in that piece of of the inclusion group etc or is in the larger organization that um, especially from a gender point of view women are talent first and gender next okay value your own self if we start valuing our self we start valuing our thoughts is the time when we will bring them out there are no covering behaviors there cannot be any covering behaviors if any organization today also pushes people to have behaviors which need to be covered or you cannot be yourself really think if you really want to be that right uh, the second thing is from a gender point of view as suman suman mentioned that more and more women are aspiring to have uh, have a seat on the table ask yourself this question that every time an opportunity either was given to you or existed did you go and ask for it or not go ahead and ask for it okay but ensure that you are as competent as any other talent in that organization go and ask and say it is mine i will take it i will prove it i will balance my uh, personal life i'll balance my work life you don't have to be worried about about it i'll figure it out take that responsibility and move forward do not expect to be differentiated in no way should be differentiated but it doesn't take away the onus from the organizations if they have to create a better ecosystem if they have to create policies to make um, make women do their job more comfortably that is something the organizations have to do and believe me if they don't do it they're not going to survive right so the infrastructure have to be created but do not expect to be differentiated or be entitled just because you are part of the diversity and inclusion group right so these are just thoughts that i wanted to leave this section with thank you so much thanks sarshita thanks for giving the uh, you know an actual organizational context there uh, there are some uh, best practices that you know we we would like in addition to whatever harshita has already shared uh, to also be shared and along with best practices on building an inclusive culture from other organizations um, i think our passion of it doesn't allow us to uh, do it now and i do believe that you know we require a full hour to actually discuss uh, the best practices that have been used and that have been successful and i can see that a couple of questions are also around a, you know how it has actually been done uh, so what we are proposing to do is that we will uh, we will also have a part 2 of this webinar soon uh, where we can also go into you know go in depth into the best practices having said that i will request harshita to share at least an overview 
of what all has been done at Nestle. And then, you know, if time permitting and if she can join us again, then she can take us through the details of those. Uh, so, Harshita, just requesting you to, you know, provide an overview or an overarching umbrella for what has been done. And uh, then, you know, the specifics we can do in the next section. Absolutely. So quickly, just taking you through an overview of this, uh, our strategy around uh, diversity and inclusion is same as our any any strategy around any talent. So we attract, we retain, and develop. It is extremely important, and I'm again going to overarchingly talk more about the gender gender piece because we are on the gender journey. It is extremely important that we do focused hiring of bringing in women into the jobs that we have, whether it's through targeted colleges, whether it's through looking at at building pipelines of women, we should do focused hiring. And we've, we've gone a long way in trying to do it. We've actually doubled our numbers of hiring women at a certain level and above within our organization. Once you've brought uh, women in the organization, given them given them the right roles, put them in, 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 in a space that's their space and they can perform, it is very important that you have the best policies within the organization to make it very easy for them. I'll give you an example of just one policy that we've recently put in place um, are women on the field because they actually do the brick and mortar sales officer job. These women, uh, when they when they become mothers, is the space where we were seeing that they were really slipping off uh, of the organization. What we said was that you need creches for your kids. You can go and take any creche and the organization will reimburse us. Stipulated amount to you every month. You don't need to worry that the crash will need to be owned. The organization have you use the space which uh, eco, uh, you know the, the area which is comfortable for you. Go ahead and use that. The second thing is a lot of women when they come up, come back say shit I had a traveling job I cannot travel but I need to go to this workshop or I'll miss out on something or I need to go to meet this client etc. The other thing that we've come up with is, from a policy point of view that for two, till the child is a couple of years old we we bear the cost of the mother, the child, and one additional person if they travel for, for work in any context. That's the other policy. So having the right policies, maintaining the right ecosystem is extremely important. Develop. Women are important. Women, women sometimes prove to be, have, have a little. And thus, those positions are very important to be given to women. So whether we have focusedly looked at developing our key women talent, roadmaps for them, Following through with them with things like women mentorship, exposure to uh, women in our global organization, how have they made their career. So mentorship being a big piece that we have worked on. Uh, we have a woman leadership journey that we work with. Our, our, our key talent women, uh, managerial uh, uh, level of women and above is, is where we do the focus intervention of developing them to become business heads one day. The second piece we've done is we've mandatorily ensured that in all my critical positions in all my business head uh, positions, there is a success in succession planning. There are women and we, are, we have focused developments for them. We are also one of the organization, I believe, having the largest number of expatriations and mission opportunities outside the in the global organization that we have tried to, to bring in women. Treat them as talent, give them opportunities, but create an ecosystem which can help them take those opportunities. It is the baseline that we work on. Thanks a lot, Harshita. I think that that really sets the ground for the, the part two of this webinar. Uh, in order to close this today, I think what I'd like to just close with is the three hallmarks or the three fundamentals or the three drivers for ensuring that all these policies that organizations have uh, are really implemented and really bring the benefit. I think there are three things to look at. One is a clear business outcome uh, related, uh, you know, a very clearly spelt out business outcome for why we want to be diverse and inclusive. The second one being leaders have to lead it. They have to be the sponsors. They have to be the, uh, you know, they have to be in charge of ensuring that it's happening. They have to believe in it. Unless that happens, there is no ecosystem that will become inclusive. And thirdly, when we are looking at building an inclusive culture, we can't just look at the diverse demographic. We have to look at the entire ecosystem, which will enable that objective to be met. And if those three things or those critical factors are in place, then making a culture 
you know, a reality is not going to be too much of a problem. Then the challenges will be mitigated. But these three have to be in place before we move towards uh, implementing other policies or training or structures as the case may be. Um, we do have a couple of questions. I think one of them may have got answered already through what Harshita spoke. And there is, uh, you know, there are a couple of other questions that have come in. Since we don't have the time right now to, to respond to them, we will make sure that we get back to you via, via email and respond to those questions. And also at the end, really looking forward to having all of you for the second part of the webinar uh, whenever we announce it. And we do hope that some value got created and some thoughts got ignited uh, with all of you uh, for how can you know all this input be contextualized for your organization so thank you all very much for uh, for your time and we look forward to interacting with you some more in the second section uh, thanks harshita thank you for being a part of this and we look forward to your uh, inputs and insights in the second part too thank you so much Uman. thanks for the opportunity Thank, Thank you. you, everyone. Bye-bye. Have a good day, everyone. Bye-bye.